Merci Laurent pour cette bienvenue très chaleureuse. Je suis très très ravi de d'avoir la possibilité de te présenter devant vous, euh, mais je vais le faire en, en anglais, parce que j'entends euh, que c'est la langue commune qu'on a choisie ici. Um, thank you so much for that warm welcome, uh, Laurent, and for the possibility to introduce to you uh, the, well, at the end of the day, we rebranded it as the Digital Consumer Book Barometer. Um, And my talk has two parts. The first is pretty much about explaining and contextualizing why we switched from e-books to digital consumer books. And that is going to summarize and give some context to several of the talks that we've had uh, during the day. And then I will uh, walk you through a few of the findings of our barometer. When we think about reading, we still have in mind that iconic situation of one person being immersed by a book. But that has changed very dramatically. People are rushing and moving about books, and they are very much interacting between and, and, and switching between, between reading something, watching something, and communicating between each other. So suddenly, Uh, there is many more modes than one when we speak about reading. Uh, it's about immersion, but it's also more and more about being a part of a network and of communication. We can see that in many, many circumstances. For instance, at Amazon, of course, it began as a bookseller and has still a catalog of millions of books on the website. But now it changed roles and became a publisher. And then it started to more and more systematically uh, move all types of contents in one environment, which we better call an ecosystem. Similar things happen to authors. We have suddenly not only publishers, but we have platforms like Wattpad platforms who then, after offering authors the possibility and uh, the tools to write, to publish electronically and to interact with their audience community, they rebranded themselves as Wattpad Studios because suddenly they discovered they are about many more things than just writing and reading. It's about media suddenly. It's about more and more segmented, specialized user groups. For instance, they have an LGBT best-selling list, which you wouldn't find in Livre Hebdo. They have just one best-selling list for fiction and another one for non-fiction or for children's. So suddenly, the entire concept, when we talk about a reading or a book audience, is becoming much more segmented, fragmented. But It all is framed increasingly by a screen. And even when the book is printed, when we read it, we have perhaps discovered it on the screen. We have exchanged our views, our assessments with others on that screen. So the screen has turned the whole thing from a writing platform of fan fiction, in the case of Wattpad, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, into a multi-platform entertainment company for original stories. So from writing to storytelling is the journey. And we see it that one individual author, J.K. Rowling, famous for Harry Potter series, has turned her experience into a media empire and we really understand Rowling and her achievements when we think back of what Walt Disney had been doing about uh, after, well, not creating, but grabbing Mickey Mouse, because it was not Walt Disney who invented Mickey Mouse as a character, remind you. Uh, but he turned that into the basis of a multi-billion dollar uh, media industry that still exists today. And in the case of Rowling with Potter Moore, a similar thing, still smaller than Disney, but still very, very, very interesting, has seen the light of the day by 
uh, promoting standardized ways of globalization, <laughs> by being very, very innovative uh, with regard to technologies, and by, commod uh, co uh, by a commoditization process of how authors bring across their stories. Uh, these are a few bestseller snapshots, not from the Livre Hebdo or Bookseller Publishers Weekly or Nielsen data, but on a much more uh, consumer-oriented um, perspective, the various charts of Amazon. And we took several times over the past two years snapshots of those very segregated um, uh, best-selling charts of Amazon, uh, where they have one for books, and one for fiction, and one for romance, and one for Kindle books, and one for audiobooks. And we aggregated this for four countries. I just show you two, Germany and France, uh, because there are some funny patterns. Number one is you find very few p uh, books that you would have on the traditional best-selling lists. These are much more reflecting that new type of audiences, which are, as I said, um, follower of uh, different types. Uh, you see different um, new models of publication, like uh, uh, Rowling's Potter Moore, very high up in these ranks, in all four countries, by the way, which is rare. You see suddenly Amazon's own publishing initiatives, which are there. You see with the high prices, on the one hand, that audiobooks have become, even across the board, a much larger presence, but also have totally different, uh, differently priced books, like 299.99, self-published literature, and you have many series. So suddenly you are in, in an environment that is really framed by that screen which I showed you, and we see it in um, research by the Global Web Index that even uh, traditional readers more and more use their mobile smartphones in a very central functionality or a set of functionalities when they go about satisfying their appetite for reading or for listening. So we moved from a book universe to something new that I try to call the digital consumer books. And that is not about format anymore. It's not about e-books. And audiobooks are not exciting because they are a new format. It's about that there are much more dynamic ecosystems and platforms and different coexisting business models and different coexisting uh, formats and distribution channels. So it's really a totally different environment where format has lost its importance. Therefore, it doesn't make sense a lot to speak about e-books or audiobooks in that regard. New models of creation and publication have successfully emerged and formed their own segment uh, of the publishing industry, being in a coexistent uh, coexistence with the traditional publisher's model. And we see an, an, an array of new actors coming and very, very massively con uh, conquering that field. We learn that it has become more complex, more, more versatile. Uh, and it's more and more, that's also the serial, uh, serialization factor, it's becoming a stream as opposed to a book as a closed container and format. And therefore, we speak of the digital consumer books as a larger umbrella encompassing all those events. The problem is now, how can we measure such a fluid universe or ecosystem? Because here we could count the titles and the numbers of copies, and that is not possible anymore. And one attempt to do this is this um, consumer book barometer, which we started two years ago, and which uh, has one unique characteristic in that it's a collaborative effort where e-book distributors or digital book distributors from a number of countries have agreed to share data and we aggregate these data and anonymize these data so that they can be published. And so we have real sales data as the basis of our information. 
Now, there is one funny point. We have now in the new barometer that just came out a few weeks ago, uh, five countries. Uh, we have uh, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, and Canada. In the middle of that region, taking Canada aside, there is one country missing. I invite you to guess, and that's my secret mission for next year to fill that gap. The reason for that slide is a different one. Uh, I try with three, four slides to make you aware of the differences between the digital world and the print world. Here is the calendar in four different uh, countries uh, of ebook revenue uh, covering 2016, 17, and 18, so three years. And you see, at least in the case of Germany and Italy, but in a little bit more complicated uh, tendency also in the other ones, it's much more continuous in uh, print books, the sales curve is end of the year Christmas craziness and very flat before. Here we have spe uh, pikes, uh, spikes in summer. We have a very strong summer season. We have all kinds of dynamics. So that's a much more uh, sustainable market in a way than print books. The second thing is we have started to slice these data by price and we have started to understand that you always must um, look not only at the money, the revenue, but also at the units, the volume, because as we will see, you have a few differences. Canada, which is also due to the currency, a Canadian, Canadian dollar being less than a Euro, um, they have different price preferences than all the others. The colors are different countries. You have a few very interesting sweet spots where you make the most of the money, even if you don't sell so many copies, that's around eight euros or nine euros. Uh, you see slight differences between uh, countries. And then you also see that you have a few very interesting uh, spots on the left side where the price points are below three, four, five euros which is all the self-published and all the promotional series literature which is sold at that. But you see from below, this is massive volumes. Why is this important? Because if I'm an author, a publisher, I can use that kind of analysis in understanding where is my position on the market and how can I define a pricing strategy? Is it reasonable to sell a book at uh, an ebook at 18 euros? Probably not. Is it totally foolish to sell it at three euros? Not necessarily. It ma can make sense if I have a series. So that is basically a marketing tool. And then we started to understand how is the life cycle of ebooks. For print books, we know usually you launch an e uh, a printed title in fall, the big new novel and you hope that it sells until Christmas, and that's basically it. Very few big, uh, books last longer than these three to six months. We see here, however, that that exists in e-books. That's the sales during one year, month by month by month by month, by the top 10 titles of um, distributors in Germany and Italy. You see the fast-selling titles on both sides, but you also see these, these sausages which stay thick and fat and bring revenue, and at the end of the year, they can be as powerful or even more powerful as a fast-seller. So we see suddenly there are much different opportunities in e-books. The third thing is we started to include audiobooks, just for Germany, but still. And here we saw a few years back in 2016, it was very much about just one genre. It was audiobooks were very strong in fiction and especially in thrillers. A few years on, in early 19, uh, 2019, you see between fiction, children, uh, thrillers, and fantasy a kind of equilibrium. So we have a much broader scope when we add audiobooks because we can reach target audiences like children and young adult and also non-fiction readers, these are men for instance, uh, which we wouldn't be able to reach 
with the e-books. And then we were happy to get also some data from Ingram, the world, uh, world's largest wholesaler, who obviously started to experiment in 2016 how to better uh, make their, their, their English language titles available in major um, European markets. And oops, we have even f figures for France here in that chart. And we see in all four markets a very interesting tendency that at the beginning, only the very cheap literature was really finding um, consumers in, in, in Europe. But in the very short course of three, three and a half years, that became much more balanced. So there is one red line across all those different angles of analysis, and that's a very good news. The complete realm of digital consumer books is much broader and much more balanced and much more um, sophisticated. There are more opportunities when we understand how that market ticks than what we have had in mind before by thinking, oh, e-books, forget them, it's just about romance titles uh, selling at 199 if at all. Uh, so this is the interesting news that we tried uh, to, to, to analyze and bring about with the digital <coughs> consumer book barometer, which, we, uh, which you can download way too cheap. You know, we are believers in our own message that it makes sense sometimes to give away stuff. At global-ebook.com, it's for download, for free download. You don't have to pay it. And we are in the process of adding more digital uh, reports. There will be a new global ebook report coming out in September, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So keep us posted and help me, please, to fill that French gap. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rüdiger. Do we have some questions in the room? I'm Ted from the Dutch Library. Uh, most of your talk was about uh, sales. How do you see the role from libraries and subscription services in this whole ecosystem? Because if you are going more to not owning things and more, well, lending and, and, and things like that, how is this going to, to change the picture? Uh, I'm not being paid by Steve Potash of Overdrive, but I repeat his main message, which is publishers miss out on a lot of sales by ignoring libraries. Uh, and I think... Uh, I wouldn't even get into the so complicated topic of ownership versus uh, borrowing, but I think um, libraries are a wonderful tool or environment for promotion, for discoverability, for engaging with new audiences. One of the main concerns from my point of view for pu traditional publishing is the very, very limited demography that they appeal to. It's... Uh, not a reflection of today's societies which have immigrants, other languages. This is, lang uh, this is libraries. And um, I think that's a huge opportunity that uh, we should pay attention to much more. But I'm not paid by overdrive. I see none. So I'll be around over coffee. Thank you very much. Good <laughs> to